Chapter 7. The Borodjbisti in the Denikin Underground. A. Formation of the Ukrainian Communist Party Borodjbisti, UCPB. While the armies of the Ukrainian People's Republic were fighting in the approaches to Kyiv in August 1919, an important event occurred in the life of the UPSR Communist Borodjbisti. The central committees of the UPSR Communist Borodjbisti and the USDRP left independence by joint decision announced the formation of a new Ukrainian political party in a covering letter of a memorandum which was directed to the executive committee of the Communist International. The memorandum, primarily an appeal to economic factors rather than to ethical values, outlined briefly the peculiarities of the social and economic development of Ukraine which made incumbent the formation of a single communist center. The covering letter reads as follows. To the Executive Committee of the Third Communist International, by decision of the Central Committees of the Ukrainian Social Democratic Workers' Party Left Independence and the Ukrainian Party of Socialist Revolutionaries Communists of August 6, 1919, both parties named have merged into one Ukrainian Communist Party, Borodjbiste, with the motto, Workers of the World Unite. The act of merging into a single communist party two detachments of Ukrainian communists, which until now have participated separately in the proletarian revolution in Ukraine, is a great crowning moment in the development of the Ukrainian communist movement, which accurately expresses the real command of local social reality, and at the same time is a new point of departure in the future organizational and ideological consolidation of communist forces in the towns and villages of Ukraine. The deep split within the ranks of the Ukrainian socialist parties and the dividing off of the communist forces which grow organically out of the aggregate of social and economic conditions in Ukraine began immediately after the February Revolution of 1917 and by the first siege of Kyiv by the troops of Soviet Russia had reached such intensity and force that the representatives of the left wing of the Ukrainian socialist parties were arrested and condemned to execution by the right wing which then controlled all political life in Ukraine. The subsequent course of the revolution brought the split to its inevitable end. The left wing, that organic cell of Ukrainian communism, irrevocably took up the struggle in the name of rule by Soviets as the only organizational form of the di dictatorship of the proletariat. The ranks of fighters united around the organizational center of Ukrainian communism during the dark period of Hetmanid reaction, they were tempered in the heroic and ruthless struggle both against it and against the Ukrainian National Union, which disguised its counter-revolutionary nature with democratic phraseology. The disorganization of the Hetmanid apparatus by vigorous action and the un unmasking of the counter-revolutionary nature of the Ukrainian National Union before the eyes of the Ukrainian proletariat and peasantry led Ukrainian communist forces to the uprising against the Hetmanid. To the active control of that uprising, including the seizure of Poltava, Zhitomir, Zhmerinka, and other localities, and to the decisive struggle against the product of the National Union, the Directory, both and the head of insurgent detachment, and at the Toilers' Congress convened by the Directory. In the heat of this struggle for the greatest ideal of our age, a struggle in the name of rule by Soviets, the, least the last threads are being cut, the last traces of former contacts with the comp compromising parties are vanishing, and the intrinsic nature of the organizational and ideological center of Ukrainian communist forces, which has been strengthened in the battle, is outgrowing the bounds of old party names. The struggle against the Hetmanet and the Directory was conducted shoulder to shoulder with the communist Bolsheviks of Ukraine. The deep realization of all the dangers arising out of the existence of two communist centers in, the Ukra in Ukraine forced the organizational and ideological core of Ukraine communist forces, the communist, the communist Borodbisti, to call in Munich 19, in March 1919 for the formation of an inter-party Soviet center at the moment of uprising and for organizational merger which the communist Bolsheviks. The urgent need for the creation of a single communist center in Ukraine has not been understood and evaluated by the communist Bolsheviks of Ukraine. The experience of the subsequent development of the proletarian revolution in Ukraine, the practical participation of the Borodjbiste in the formation of the Soviet government and its fateful outcome, have sharpened the awareness among the ranks of Ukrainian communists of the urgent need to create a single communist center, 
which will grow organically out of the aggregate of social and economic conditions and peculiarities of Ukraine. A consideration of this experience and the increased understanding of the next and most important task in the development of the revolution in Ukraine have led to the merger of two detachments of Ukrainian Communist forces into one Ukrainian Communist Party, Borodbiste, which has assumed the leadership of the Ukrainian Communist movement and its representation in the ranks of the Third International. Facing the eclipse of the Second Proletarian Revolution in Ukraine, entering a period of the fiercest reaction in Ukraine, leading the entire party and together with it, going underground in preparation for a new struggle, the Central Committee of the Ukrainian Communist Party, Borodjbiste, announces the entry of the party into the ranks of the Third International and sends warm greetings to the leaders of the Proletarian Revolution, assuring them that assuring assuring them that the hour is at hand when, forged together by one communist center, the workers and peasants of Ukraine will start a new uprising in the name of rule by Soviets, and the regenerated Ukrainian Soviet Republic once again will engage in open battle with the enemies of international communism, Kyiv, August 28, 1919, Central Committee of the Ukraine Communist Party, Borodjbiste. By implication, the covering letter scored the Bolshevik leaders in Ukraine who fled to Russia with the retreating Red Army in the hope of eventually returning under the protection of a victorious Red Army. The meeting of the central committees of the world of the two old of the two old parties at which this joint decision was made came to be regarded as the first congress of the new UCPB. Both parties participated in the merger on a party basis, although actually one large party. The UPSR Communist Borodbiste was joined by a small left-wing group of Kievan SD independents. The left-wing independents had refused to follow the USDRP independence in the latter's activity opposition to the Bolshevik control government in the, sp in the spring of 1919. When the USDRP independence became an underground organization creating an all-Ukrainian revolutionary committee which declared open warfare against Rakovsky's government, the left wing remained a legal organization. Under the leadership of Pan Kiev and Hukovich, they became known as left independence. Through their representative at the All Ukraine Congress to Volost Executive Committees in Kyiv in June 1919, the left independence officially co conveyed their greetings to the Congress. They condemned the participation of the USDRP independence in the anti Bolshevik uprisings, yet at the same time criticized the excesses of Rakovsky's government. The left independence thus moved close to the Borodjbist position, and their merger with the Borodjbiste was the logical consequence. As Marxists who had long since accepted the doctrine of the dictatorship of the proletariat, the left independence escaped the ideological crisis for which the Borodjbiste passed. In the minds of the Borodjbiste, as they came under the influence of Marxism and their movement toward communism, the heritage of populism seemed a political liability. Given this frame of mind, the Borodjbiste found merger with the USDRP left independence for a small group of considerable ideological and political significance. Through them, the new party, the UCPB, rid itself of the populist heritage of Borodjbism. At the same time, the merger strengthened the opposition of Ukrainian leftist parties to the Bolsheviks. No longer did the Borodjbiste feel compelled to demonstrate that they were as good Marxists as the Bolsheviks. They can now claim before the Communist International and before the Ukrainian urban proletariat that they were demanding for, for Ukraine no more than the sovereignty due every nation, while the Bolsheviks were actually subjugating Ukraine to Russia. The Borodjbiste, it is clear, hoped that the Communist International would draw the proper in inference that for, the, that for Ukraine, at least, they had become better Marxists than the Bolsheviks. Lenin, who carefully followed the Borodjbiste moves, soon claimed the very opposite. On February 22, 1920, he wrote, I emph emphatically insist that the Borodjbiste be accused not of nationalism, but of counter-revolutionary and petty bourgeois mentality. The implication was that even though the Borodjbiste agreed with the Bolsheviks on the national question, which was not the case, they were unre unreliable as Marxists, the Borodjbiste, for their part, an anxious to obliterate their populist past, treated the left independence as equals and accepted the Marxist slogan, Workers of the World Unite. With the infusion of new Marxist blood into the party, the Borodjbiste hope re revitalized to re-enter the struggle against the Bolsheviks for a sovereign communist Ukraine. B. Two views on the formation of the UCPB. 1. The dual roots theory. The Bundesrafis, writing during the Denikin occupation in 1919, oversimplified the Borodjbist point of view when he quoted one of their planks. 
support for the national culture of young nations, to demonstrate that the new party and the words of its initiators is based on a Marxist outlook, but differs from the Bolsheviks in its views on the national question. The heart of the matter lay not merely in the national culture of young nations, but in their equality and independence. Another former Bundist, Ravich Cherkasi, writing as a Bolshevik in 1923, described the formation of the UCPB in the following words. At a time when Mazurenko, Drachomiretsky, and other leaders of the independence stirred up Kulak rebellions and pogroms, a small but consolidated group split away and created a new party of left independence Ukrainian Social Democrats. This group was headed by Pankivin Hukovich. The Boroj Bisti, as the Ukraine left SR party, indisputably showed themselves to be revolutionaries during the struggle between the Bolsheviks and the Directory. During the entire period of Soviet rule in Ukraine in 1919, the Boroj Bisti gradually, very slowly, it is true, rid themselves of their traditional semi petlurist tendencies. Before that time, considerable strata of the peasantry had been more or less under their influence. After the Third Congress of the CPBU branded them as petty bourgeois national socialists, the Boroj Biste, in seeking to influence the urban proletariat, began to polish up on the Marxist view of history, gradually destroying the vestiges of their SR prejudices. In August 1919, this process of adaptation to the proletarian revolution was crowned by the merger of the Boroj Biste with the above-mentioned group of Ukrainian SD left independence. This merger of quantity and relatively even of quality undoubtedly increased the prospects of the Borodjbisti to acquire the right to call themselves communists. In his history of the CPBU, Ravich Cherkasi in 1923 advanced the idea, for which he was condemned by official Soviet critics in the late 1920s, that the CPBU was not a branch of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik, but the new Communist Party in Ukraine created by Bundes Borodjbisti, Jewish communists Borbiste and Ukapiste, as well as the Bolsheviks. By 1923, this theory of the multiple origin of the CPBU was also accepted by, by former Borodjbiste, themselves members of the CPBU. On the other hand, the Bolsheviks, having once consolidated their power in the 1920s and having absorbed the other leftist parties, rejected the view that the CPBU was a confluence of many streams. Rather, they claimed that the elements in the CPBU of non-Bolshevik origin had quickly become assimilated, and so far as the essential ideology of the CPBU is concerned, they were correct. Wielding un- undivided power, the Bolsheviks preserved their basic party doctrine, but the Borojbiste and later the Ukapiste nonetheless did, an inf- did influence the policy of the CPBU with respect to the national question Ukrainization. When the Bolsheviks later decided to abandon this policy, they had to destroy all the former Borojbiste and Ukapiste within the CPBU. The Boruj Biste themselves considered their merger with the left independence to be an ine- inevitable consequence of the Ukrainian revolution. As the Ukrainian peasantry was divided into kulaks and twinning peasants, and the latter into the well-off middle peasant and the hired laborer, the Ukrainian party of SR communists, the party of the Ukrainian peasant proletariat, crystallized more and more out of the ill-defined old opportunist party of the Ukrainian SRs, with a similar crystallization of the purely proletarian elements out of the mass of workers, intellectuals and petty bourgeoisie which had been under the influence of the USDRP, there arose the party of left independence, linked primarily with the industrial proletariat of Ukraine, the proletariat of the city. Since the interests of all proletarian groups were identical, the splits in the USDRP and the UPSR ever more forcefully bore out the need to unify the communist forces in city and village. 2. The Bolshevik Argument in order to understand why the Bolsheviks and Lenin in particular took such a hostile stand toward the Borod Biste, especially toward their efforts to gain a- admittance to the Third International, it is necessary to consider briefly the Bolshevik argument. A synthesis of their argument based on statements by Lenin and other prominent Bolsheviks would run as follows. 1. The cardinal political difference between the Bolshevik party and all other Soviet parties was that the Bolsheviks had guided the revolution to the Soviet platform, indeed had fostered and created the Soviet system, while all other parties had merely been drawn toward that platform. The correctness of this thesis was supported even by the Borodjbist pronouncement that the UCPB had arisen as the result of a process of differentiation within the Ukrainian peasantry and urban proletariat under the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution. 2. 
such an empirical explanation for the origin of Borodivism, whose radical was the product of revolutionary events, harbored the danger that an, eb that an ebbing of the revolutionary wave among the masses might well impair that radicalism. 3. The Borodivist proposition that the UCPB was the only center around which Ukrainian communist forces could crystallize was not valid. Chronologically, the left USDRP led by Neronovich had been the first such center while, besides the Borodivisti, another possible center was the Ukrainian Communist Party, the Ukapisti, which had held its constituent congress in Kyiv January 22 to 25, 1920. Borodivism therefore represented but one stage in the crystallization of Ukrainian communist forces. The proper rallying center was the Bolshevik organization of the industrial proletariat, which were an integral part of Ukrainian life no less than the prof pro professedly Ukrainian movements. 4. It would be more correct to speak of the CPBU as possibly independent of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik, as had been suggested by the Ukrainian Bolshevik Shakhrai, than to suggest the transfer of leadership of the Ukrainian proletarian revolution from the proletarian party, the Bolsheviks, to a party which at best could not aspire to be proletarian. 5. The existence of a large Russified urban proletariat in Ukraine made the formation of a purely Ukrainian government impossible during the difficult period of the revolution. Such a government would inevitably be controlled by the peasants rather than by, by the workers, a circumstance which would destroy the fundamental aim of the revolution, the dictatorship of the proletariat. 6. Even if other proletarian parties were to attempt to rise to the top in, the, in Ukraine or if the CPBU itself were to attempt to become independent, Bolshevism would ruthlessly beat down such attempts because the dictatorship of the proletariat in backward peasant countries could be realized only by means of a highly centralized communist party. 7. Given the existing conditions, there could be no talk of administrative equality between the territory of Russia, which contained the center of the, revolutionary, uh, of the revolution and a territory, Ukraine, where the revolution was directed by that center. Speaking at the 8th All-Russian Conference of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik on December 3rd, 1919, Lenin stated, Comrade Dmitro Z. Manuelsky is greatly mistaken in thinking that we reproach them, the Ukrainian Bolsheviks, for separatism, samostinost, in the national sense, in the sense of independence, nezavisimost, for Ukraine. We reproach them for their separatism in the sense of their not wishing to reckon with Moscow's views, the views of the Central Committee in Moscow. This word samostinost, which was used in jest, had quite a different meaning. This method of granting nominal independence to non-Russian peoples, while in actual fact subordinating them to Moscow, the center of world revolution, was later applied by Stalin in gaining control over the so-called satellite states of Eastern Europe. The Russian Bolshevik attitude toward the Borodvisti is best illustrated in a draft resolution entitled, entitled our, our attitude toward the Borodbisti, sketched probably by Lenin himself, concerning the liquidation of Borodbism. Found among the, Tro the Trotsky papers preserved at Harvard University, it bears the date May 1919. 1. The bloc of our party with the Borodbisti had as its aim to attract to a sustained communist policy a young political party in the social structure of Ukraine, still so poor in experience. 2. In making this experiment, our party had clearly in mind the fact that it might have directly opposite results, namely that it might ha hasten the, the degeneration of the Borodjbisti into a militant party of counter-revolution, with the splitting off from it of its most honest and, con and conscious socialist elements. 3. In either case, the drawing of the party of Borodjbisti into governmental responsibility by hastening the political evolution of the party would have a progressive meaning since it shortened the period of indefiniteness and formlessness of political groupings and relationships. 4. At the present time it can be confirmed with full conviction that the party of Borodjbisti has evolved to the right to the side of degeneration into an intellectual political group, basing itself mainly on Kulak elements of the villages and on swindler scoundrelly elements of the city, including also the greater part of the working class. 7. Under the guise of a struggle for Ukrainian independence, which found its expression in the Ukrainian Soviet government, the Borodjbisti have carried on a disorganizing struggle against the necessary union and unification of the economic app apparatuses serving the interests of both countries. By this they help economic chaos and threaten to undermine all the work for economic construction in Ukraine and in Russia. 8. 
especially criminal, however, is the work of the Borodjeviste in the military field. In the guise of a struggle for an independent Ukrainian army, the Borodjeviste support the partisan bands by word and deep opposition, opposing them to the Red Army and are multiplying thereby the elements of banded chaos which are leading Ukraine to the brink of chaos. Under the conditions of a far from completed struggle in Ukraine with internal and external counter-revolution, the encouragement of partisanism, the organization of the armed forces into independent guerrilla detachments, which has already surrendered the worker peasant Ukraine into the hands of the hated enemy, is nothing but subservience to the bandits of imperialism and the delivery of a treacherous stab in the back to the Soviet power. 11. It is incumbent upon the leading elements of our party and of the Soviet power in Ukraine to open a most serious, attentive and energetic campaign against the party of the Borodjbiste, exposing its intelligentsia, careerist, chauvinist and ex exploitokulakist character. 12. Attention must be especially paid to all those cases where Borodjbiste directly or indirectly support corrupted partisans and undermine the authority and strength of the Russo-Ukrainian rossisko ukrainskoy Red Army. 13. It is incumbent upon the corresponding Soviet organizations not to leave unanswered even one single chauvinist anarcho kulakist declaration of the Borodjbiste. It is necessary by means of merciless exposure to make the genuinely alert section of the Tordors who follow the Borodjbiste aware of the fact that the road of this party is the road to the inevitable ruin of Soviet Ukraine. 14. It is necessary to reckon with the fact that a certain number of pure socialist elements have so far stayed in the ranks of the Borodjbiste because of the official communist banner of this party and its external revolutionary phraseology. 15. By means of all measures in indicated above, by means of a, of a broad and energetic exposure of the chauvinistic politics of the Borodjbiste, by means of the attraction into our own ranks of its best elements in the mercies of this dispersion of the Machnoist and Petlurist elements in the ranks of the Borodjbiste, our party must in a short time prepare the conditions for driving the Borodjbiste out of the ranks of the government and for the complete liquidation of the Borodjbiste as a recognized Soviet party. It is well to recall that in May 1919, Ataman Khekhoryev launched his attack against the Bolsheviks. The caustic tone of the resolution can be partially explained by the bitterness which the Bolsheviks felt toward the Borodjbiste at that time. A supplementary decision at the very end of the resolution mentions that the moment of liquidation is to be determined by the Politburo in Moscow and communicated to the Ukrainian Revolutionary Military Council. But the moment of liquidation, as planned by Lenin, never came because Bolshevik control came to an end in the summer of 1919 with the advance of Denikin's armies. There is a revealing comment on the covering letter of the Boris Beast Memorandum written probably by Grigory Zinoviev the head of the Russian delegation to the Communist International and editor of its journal, from the editorial office. At the Congress of the Communist International in Moscow in March 1919, Ukraine was represented by the Communist Party of, the, of Ukraine, CPU Bolshevik. Only this party, the proletarian organization in Ukraine which has behind it about 20 years of work, now belongs organizationally to the Communist International. The Executive Committee of the Communist International regards its, it as its duty to demand that only one communist party compri comprising all communist forces should exist in every country. The communist international will also demand this in Ukraine. Thus, the genocide-like policy of the Bolsheviks stands fully revealed. To the outside world, the Bolsheviks appeared as recognizing Ukraine as a separate country, whose representative in the communist international had the same rights as our communist representatives. But behind the closed doors of Inner Party Council, Moscow accepted the Rakovsky dictum that, the, that Ukraine was the in, invention of a few intellectuals. The reply of the Communist International to the Border Beast Memorandum was made public only in 1920, after the Denikin period, and will be considered later. Here it will be sufficient to note that during the Denikin occupation of Ukraine, the Border Beast Central Committee commissioned a special delegation headed by Grigory Hrinko and Levko Kovalev, the Foreign Bureau, Zaburizhnoye Buyuro to represent the Borodbis brief before the Communist International in Moscow. C. Borodbis opposition to the Denikin regime. Only the people's despair under the second Soviet Russian occupation of Ukraine can explain the success of Denikin's drive in left bank Ukraine in the summer of 1919. Denikin's military superiority to the army of the Ukrainian People's Republic was due first to the fact that he had better troops. So numerous were the Tsarist officers in the volunteer army 
that at times regiments consisted entirely of officers and second to the fact that it was recognized by the Entente and was supplied by Great Britain. To a people exhausted by the ravages of civil war, the coming of Denikin, perhaps because of his monarchist orientation, evoked memories of a pre-revolutionary peaceful life. However, even the first days of the new regime proved disappointing. Supported by Russian landowners and former Tsarist financiers and industrialists, the regime aimed at a complete restoration of, a, of pre-revolutionary conditions. In the wake of his army came landowners to reclaim their property, factories, mines, and various enterprises were returned to the old proprietors. The social contrasts now became unbearable. To make matters worse, a new reign of terror was instituted. This time against the poorer peasantry, the Jews, and the Ukrainian patriots. Once in Kiev, Denikin issued an appeal from the commander-in-chief to the population of Little Russia, using the derogatory Malorossiya, which had been the traditional Tsarist term for Ukraine. The Denikin regime refused to recognize the right of national autonomy, let alone national independence. Ukraine schools were closed, libraries destroyed, and Ukrainian leaders executed without trial. For years, pro progress in the national field was wiped out. The cadet N.Y. Astrov, an, office, an official of the Denikin government, pointed out that violence, torture, pillage, drunkenness, odious behavior of governmental representatives in local areas, the impunity of criminals, the weak, clumsy people, the cowards, and the debauchees in local areas, people who brought with them old vices, old ignorance, laziness, and arrogance, all discredited the new government. 1. The Borodjbist Underground in Kiev The conditions created by the Denikin occupation were ideal for underground activity. The Central Committee of the CPBU dissolved the party as a separate organization on October 2, 1919, thus admitting the fiasco of its policy, which had brought about its downfall. The Bolshevik underground was far weaker than it had been under the Hetmanate. Even Soviet sources admit this. The rear echelon bureau, Zafront, Zafront Bureau, of the Central Committee of the CPBU sent only 800 party workers into the underground, all of them young and inexperienced. According to a Soviet historian of the Dinikin period, Deikin, the Bolshevik underground in the, Ky in the Kyiv area was very weak. The Borobiste did some work, but the Borobiste were much more effective. A Borobist member of the underground, Sergei D. Misti Mistislavsky, pseudonym of Maslovsky, recalls that we did not see any great need for propaganda. Agitation spread, so to speak, of itself through the efforts of the volunteer authorities, but words could, could surpass the forcefulness Yarkosch, of their agitation by deed. The Central Committee of the UCPB, located in Kyiv, re-established the system of party emissaries which the Borodjbist underground had instituted during the period of the Hetmanate. In an un unguarded moment, Mikhailichenko, one of the most important members of the Borodjbist Central Committee, was seized. On November 7 and 8, Khnat Mikhailichenko, Khrikhori Kostaryuchenko, apprehended with papers addressed to he headquarters of the 12th Army, Concerned with coordinating a drive on Kyiv from within and from within, Vasily Shumak and, Kla and Klaivdiya Kovaliva were arrested and executed on the spot. This was the first serious setback in the entire period of the underground. The loss of Khnat Mikhailichenko was particularly serious. He was a man of complete integrity, a true revolutionary, an excellent worker, and a talented writer. The setback of the Borodjbiste. We, the Borodbiste, explained as the result of their carelessness, they exposed their underground for the few days of the October seizure of Kyiv by the Red Army. The committee held an open meeting in the premises of the former Borodbis club on the corner of Prorizhna and Pushkin streets. As a matter of fact, our, our underground workers were also expected to be at the meeting, but warned that the Soviet forces had begun a retreat they did not attend. Those who attended the meeting were somehow seen and, and followed. The circumstances of their arrest could have led to further disclosures, had it not been for the, for the haste shown by Denikin's counterintelligence. 
Mstislavsky points out that Dinikin's counterintelligence moved rapidly because of the reappearance of the Borojba's underground organ Borojba in early November. Every line of Borojba was a flame, an unconditional call to revolt. The Borojbist underground, manned mostly by young people, lived the days of illegal struggle on the whole with great enthusiasm, great buoyancy and joy. These qualities also marked the newspaper, which was permeated with a militant spirit and confidence in victory despite literary deficiencies. Borojba described the progress of the international movement in a leading article summing up the results of the communist revolution. As this, as this very, uh, at this very hour, the revolution in Eastern Europe, having experienced its most critical moment, is now recovering from the blow and going over to the attack. The volunteer army and the Petlura regime are disintegrating and rotting. The fighting spirit of the Red Army is rising. The revolutionary wave in Ukraine is growing. The revolution is in full swing. The struggle is reaching its climax in order the sooner to finish the fight, in order that all men may the sooner turn their swords into into plowshares and heal the wounds if inflicted by the imperialist war and forced civil war, communism calls on all workers, all the oppressed and downtrodden to arms, to battle. Under the red banner of international struggle, workers of the world unite. The first two orders issued by the Borodby Central Committee deserve to be reproduced in full. Order number one. Workers and peasants. The Tsarist generals, the hirelings of the English and other capitalists, have proclaimed mobilization. Their own forces, the forces of the volunteer hirelings and the landowners' white guardist officers' sons and the rich Cossacks from the Don and Kuban are no longer sufficient. Even with their aid, they have no hope of defeating the revolutionary workers and peasants' army and the Red insurgents. Therefore, they proclaim compulsory mobilization so as to destroy the workers' and peasants' revolution through you and your forces, to regain their worldly rights with your callous hands, and to leave you, your, ch your children and brothers, who have already shed rivers of blood in the slavery of capitalism. This shall not be. At this moment, when the capitalists of Europe are barely holding out against the wave of revolution, when the Red Army by its own forces has smashed Kolchak and the Don Cossacks, and is mercilessly beating the volunteers when Vor Voronezh, Oryol, Kursk, and Chernigov have been reoccupied, when the Red Forces stand before Kyiv and, and the whole Ukraine is aflame with rebellion, you will not go against your brothers, you will not aid your enemies, you will not obey the mobilization. In the name of the revolution, we proclaim the mobilization ordered by Denikin's forces to be in inoperative, and all who help to carry it out, enemies of the workers and peasants. Workers and peasants, the mad dog of capitalism, dying, is employing all means to prolong its noisome existence. Take up arms, kill it off. In a free land we shall freely build the kingdom of labor, peace and equality, the kingdom of socialism. Chief Emissary of Combat Military Affairs of the Central Committee of the UCPB. Order number two. For the special section of the Combat Emissariat of the Central Committee of the UCPB, all committees, emissaries, party members and sympathizers are ordered to collect information, lists and addresses about the volunteers and those who support the mobilization of the White Guardists and to send it immediately to the appropriate organs of the special section. The emissaries of the special section are ordered immediately to establish revolutionary terrorist courts consisting of village elders, starostei, volost elders, Starshini, chairmen and secretaries of, of, house, of house committees, etc., to try active assistance of the White Guard mobilization. Active aid in the mobilization as well as complicity in the White Guard organization is object to punishment up to and including immediate execution on a level with provocation and the transmission of information about communists and their sympathizers, chief of the special section of combat emissaries. To demonstrate that this was no empty threat, a postscript to order number two read, for treason, supplying information to the white guards on provocation, death sentences were carried out in the case of the following persons, H. Mashenko, Derusistsev, Simonkovsky, K. Kolyachenko, Ermein, Minas, and Karnachev. 
The two orders were in Russian and Ukrainian, while the rest of Vorojba was in Ukrainian. Vorojba had the distribution in Kyiv wide enough for the orders to make an impression on the population. The success of Order No. 2 was in no small measure also due to the fact that it was reprinted in a newspaper, Kyivskoye Echo, Kyivin Echo, November 8, 21, as an exposure of Bolshevik atrocities. One of the, com- of the communist methods used by the Borodbist underground in Kyiv in combating the whites was the employment of brigades of, pa- of panic mongers spread rumors through the bazaars. Although several Borodbisti, Borbisti, Bolsheviks and Bundes were executed toward the end of the Denikin regime, this did not adversely affect underground activity, at least that of the UCPB, partly because those seized had not been active, but primarily because the village was the main base of the underground movement. 2. Borodbist activity among the partisans. The course which the Denikin regime took helped to unite all opposition parties, even those hostile to one another. The Bolshevik underground leader, Svenitsky Zelezniak, reported the following characteristic event. A congress of the Initiatory Revolutionary Group of Novomoskov's district was held, was held September 26, old style. Under the influence of separatist elements, a resolution was adopted on the establishment of a socialist bloc of all left parties, including even the Petlerists, for the purpose of fighting the whites. The Congress elected a revolutionary committee which was half Petlurist and half Machnovist. The Borobiste kept in close touch with the Machnovist, the, Bor- the Borobiste and the Bolsheviks. Such relations benefited all concerned, especially the Bolshevik organizations, which has a good supply of money and arms but lacked direct contacts, as Keen frankly admits, with the village, the main base of revolutionary operations. Of the large parties and detachments of the Soviet type led by non-Bolshevik mention should be made of the one under the Borodbist Yakiv Ohi, 250 men strong, according to data of mid-September, which operated in Poltava and later in Kremenchuk districts, that under Kotsura in the region of Chigirin, Chigirin, that of the Borodbist Kosch, Matyash in Poltava district, and that of Todos Taran in Kremenchuk district. All these detachments were in touch with the Poltava Provincial Revolutionary Committee, which was made up of three communists, one left SR, i.e. Borbist, and one Borodbist, who actually did not work for he was shot en route to Kremenchuk. The communist Shavrin, Kolosov's deputy, was also on the committee. From Shavrin's orders, it is evident that non-party insurgent units operated at least in agreement with, with, if not in complete subordination, to the Provincial Revolutionary Committee. On December 16, 1919, Chavrin ordered Ohi, the commander of the insurgent Soviet Brigade, and Matyash Klemenko in Skerta with their detachments to undertake the seizure of Kremenchuk. On the same day, Chavrin issued operation orders to Kotsura, commander of the 4th Russian Ukrainian Regiment, and Petrov, commander of the insurgent Soviet unit in the, in the Soloshitsky area. The passage shows clearly the close contact made between the partisan units and the underground party organizations, yet it contains several inaccuracies. The forces of, o- of Ohi and Matyash formed one, not two units. In addition, Kin exaggerates the role of the Poltava Provincial Revolutionary Committee. The present offer was frequently in Poltava at the time and had a thorough uh, knowledge of the local underground, but cannot recall ever having heard of the committee. In any event, even the Bolshevik units did not regard such committees seriously, since their terrorized leaders had little real influence in the underground. The work of such committees was confined to supplying the partisans with arms and money, although, as a matter of fact, even these were more frequently obtained in battle with Denikin's forces. It is most unlikely that the non-Bolshevik partisan leaders Ohi, Matyash, and and Serdyuk obeyed orders of the Poltava Revolutionary Committee. On the other hand, it should be pointed out that they were hardly in a position to quarrel with the Bolshevik underground, because by mid-December, the Red Army was already deep in Ukraine. The unpopularity of the Bolshevik underground with the Ukrainian people was pointed out by the Bolshevik underground leader Pavlo Ipopov in his report of October 21, 1919, to the CPBU's Rear Echelon Bureau. The idea of Soviet governmental rule is very popular with the peasants more so than any other would be. But the approach of the Soviet armies, they fear like fire, they dream of their own Bolsheviks. The notion that Petlura made a pact with the Bolsheviks is popular. I heard it mentioned many a time while passing through Kyiv and Radomishin districts. 
More information about Boric B's partisan activity is available in King's study. The insurgent movement was widespread in Kherson province, especially in the districts of Nikolaev, Kherson, Yelisavetsgrad, now Kirovograd, and Alexandria. Here, a prominent role in organizing the insurgent movement in the villages was played by the left SR's Borojbiste and Ukrainian SR uh, left SR's Borbiste and Ukrainian SR's Borojbiste. In the village of Bashtanka Polta Poltavka, an uprising was initiated in mid-September. By peasant communists in Borojbiste, the Bolshevik Odessa Committee reported that in connection with the in intensified insurgent movement, a military insurgent provincial headquarters was established on a party basis of one agreement with the left SR's Borobiste and the Ukrainian SR's Borobiste. In Podolye, the provincial, the provincial Revolutionary Committee, the Communist Provincial Committee, the left SR's a Borobiste, and the Ukapiste Borobiste joined in calling for an armed uprising against the whites. The commander of the Kiev district was the well-known Petlurist bandit Anhel, uh, and the commander of the Poltava district was Ataman Piatenko, a former member of the Poltava province executive committee, which operated also in Kiev province. In the Moto, Motovilovka Boyarka Baduyevka Vasilkov Fastov area, an insurgent committee was created headed by the former Borodjbiste Kotsuba and Koshivei. Particularly noteworthy is the activity of the Bolshevik partisan leader Kolosov. During the Hetmanate, he, ha he had led a force of 6,000 partisans in Yekaterinoslav province. He was also mentioned in Ataman Khrikhorev's telegram to the Bolshevik Revolutionary Committee in Alexandrovsk as a member of the Council of Revolutionary Emissaries that still born Borodbist government. In the Denikin period, Kolosov, along with Savinsky Zhelezniak, Yurvin, Zhupanov, and Bukhovsky, was a member of the Revolutionary Military Council of Left Bank Ukraine and Southeastern Right Bank Ukraine. Kolosov shortly succeeded in organizing an insurgent center in the area of the so-called Samarsky forests. He established the headquarters of the 2nd Brigade in the region of Yekaterinoslav and that of the 3rd Brigade in the, in the region of Poltava. Kolosov later formed two more brigades in the region of Slavyansk and in the region of Alexand Alexand Alexandria, Comrade A. Nov Novitsky, in charge of the agency, agency of the Bolshevik Rear Echelon Bureau, wrote in one of his letters dated November 28, 1919, that Kolosov fell under the influence of Petlura's followers, and that he was popular among the insurgents. Kolosov's report before the, ra the, the Red Echelon Bureau of the Central Committee of the CPBU fully confirms Novitsky's description of him, although Kolosov attempted to demonstrate that he was master of the Petlura followers, not a day of him. A Bolshevik like Kolosov, who fell under Petlura's influence, was, for all practical purposes, an ally of the Borojbiste. Ravich Cherkasi provides more information about Borojbist underground activity. With Denikin's arrival in Kyiv, Petlura withdrew to Volin and Podolia provinces. Borojbist forces were, con were concentrated in the same areas. In close contact with the Bolsheviks, the Borojbiste fought against Petlura, stirred up an uprising among Petlura's troops, and jointly with the Bolsheviks organized the Revolutionary Council in Volin province, to which several thousand men of Petlura's army transferred their allegiance. Ataman Volokh was appointed their commander. In general, it is op impossible to deny that in right bank Ukraine, especially in Volin and Podolia provinces, the Borojbiste had a well-organized party which supplied that entire area with literature and underground workers during the Denikin period. However, they show no clear-cut tendency to seize power without the communists, the Bolsheviks. Despite very strong Borodjbist influence in this area, the Revolutionary Council consisted of only one Borodjbist, the three Bolsheviks, and one non-party man. It is true that the Bolsheviks and Volin did not at any time display particular firmness. Two Bolshevik members of the Revolutionary Council went over to the Borodjbiste. The last sentence of the above passage is very telling. It contradicts the statements that the Borodjbiste showed no clear-cut tendency to seize power without the communists. That such a tendency did exist will be evident from material to be discussed presently. The Borodjbiste were only a minority on this Revolutionary Council, a situation due to tactical rather than any other considerations, but it is almost certain that some of the Bolsheviks on the council were Borodjbist agents. 
This method of infiltrating the Bolsheviks was used by the Borodjbisti in, in other localities after the downfall of Denikin. In Kobelyaki, a scandal broke out when the local Bolshevik committee un uncovered a Borodjbist agent among its members and expelled her from the party. To be sure, the Bolsheviks too had their agents amongst the Borodjbisti. Yet for obvious reasons, the former Bundist Ravich Cherkasi exaggerates the loyalty of the Borodjbisti to the Bolsheviks. A later comer to the CPBU, Ravich Cherkasi, was attempting to, de to demonstrate that Ukrainian Bolshevism was a composite of many component streams. By the end of December 1919, the Denikin regime was in a state of total collapse, more from internal opposition than from the external pressure of the Red Army, which pursued the White Sovereign to the Black Sea with almost no resistance. The Borodjbisti played a major role in the disruption of the rear of Denikin's army. This is clear from the single fact that strong Borodjbist organizations sprang up across the country as Denikin retreated. Bolshevik organizations also appeared, but they were created only under the protection of the advancing Red Army. Indeed, the Borodjbist and Bolshevik organizations sometimes clashed. The soft dissolution of the CPBU in early October had demonstrated, perhaps most clearly, that in 1919 the CPBU was a force alien to the Ukrainian revolution, without ties with the majority of the population. It was as if the Bolsheviks by this act had openly admitted that they considered an all-Russian offensive to be their only hope of overthrowing Denikin. Had the support which Denikin received from the Entente been re rendered to Petlura, it is doubtful that such an all-Russian campaign would have succeeded.